and our starts. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paul Burstow and I'm the chair of the Social Care Institute for Excellence. I'm really pleased to see so many people have already joined this uh, webinar. Um, this is a webinar with a difference. Uh, this is the first time that I uh, run a webinar from the uh, palatial broom cupboard that is my study at home. Uh, I think it's becoming a bit of a feature for many of us now that we're working uh, remotely. Uh, and I'm delighted that as part of this, we're also overcoming a number of technical obstacles to be able to bring other people uh, in to contribute remotely as well. And I'll be looking forward to introducing one or two guests to this webinar as uh, we go forward. I think the interesting thing really is just how much uh, in the space of really no more than two, three weeks, how the world has been transformed around us, not necessarily in ways that we would have expected or indeed wanted. Uh, the world's got smaller, but it's also in many ways for many of us got more distant, possibly more frightening and certainly more isolating. And as a child of the 70s, um, one of the things that's become a recurring theme for me is that the sort of face-to-face -face meetings that many of us are used to and that sort of human contact is now replaced by uh, video conferences where we see uh, countless faces on the screen and that really brings to mind uh, that 1970s American sitcom The Brady Bunch. Uh, not necessarily one of my most favorite TV shows but nonetheless those images bring it to mind. Um, we thought at Sky that it would be really helpful to start running a series of uh, these webinars over the coming uh, days and weeks, really as a, a route to uh, get people's uh, concerns and questions. Uh, if we can't answer those questions live during the webinar, that we'll uh, post up more information uh, on our website uh, later. But we've certainly had, uh, since the outbreak began, no shortage of information from a variety of sources about how to respond to COVID. But I think there are still very many questions that people have. Indeed, when we at Sky did a piece of work with the Department of Health just a couple of weeks ago to get questions from people. We got many hundreds of questions uh, and we posted up some of the responses to those uh, questions on the Sky website just recently. Um, there are clearly questions that uh, people, uh, disabled people have, older people have, families have. And I can see on this webinar that we have uh, OTs, uh, registered managers of care homes, managers of uh, services, uh, and many others. So I'm looking forward to getting your uh, questions and actually the issues that are confronting you right here and now to see whether uh, we can get a bit of a picture of what's going on on the ground. I'm also be going to be joined by uh, two colleagues from Sky, Steve and James, and they're going to be uh, working remotely as well. And their task is to try and keep on top of all your questions and comments and where we can make sure that we're providing you with uh, answers. Um, so I think really what I wanted to do briefly was just quickly go through a few um, slides that uh, hopefully you can see on your screens and uh, just say a bit about what we've been doing at Sky since the beginning of the outbreak. Um, first, we uh, redesigned uh, the website to provide a, a hub for all the information that we felt was relevant to the social care sector, both for children's services and for adult services, gathering up the various guidance that's been published and that's uh, seems to be being well used by people out there. We also posted a series of blogs by uh, trustees of Sky, but also others that are friends and uh, colleagues of Sky, giving us both lived experience uh, of their fears and anxieties and their ways of approaching living uh, uh, socially distanced, uh, but also some experience from the front line of service delivery as well. And we're certainly looking for more examples of that sort and we're very much welcome uh, the opportunity to hear from people today. Um, we also obviously published uh, as an organisation that uh, makes sure that evidence translates into practice uh, a variety of guidance which is now more than ever very relevant, not least uh, the uh, guidance we produced with NICE around helping to prevent infections, which uh, is a really useful quick guide uh, for people to be able to review just to make sure that practice is up to, up to the very best. We've also done some work around uh, the Mental Capacity Act. The Act uh, still uh, applies and uh, there's some work that we published uh, in March of this year, uh, which again is worth referencing to uh, in the context of the COVID crisis and what it means uh, for people who may not have uh, mental capacity to make decisions for themselves. Uh, and um, we also have done some work around e-learning to make sure that there are some new e-learning and uh, other materials available for people to access 
on our website and uh, one of those is the care certificate course uh, and that slide just outlines uh, 15 items that are part of that not least at the moment with uh, so many providers taking on new staff uh, to uh, to backfill and to to manage the uh, pressures in your services um, and we published a, a set of question and answers that we received uh, from the public and from uh, service providers and others that were directed at myself uh, the current Minister for Care Services Helen Watley uh, and other colleagues in the Department of Health and we published uh, that material on the Sky website just a few days ago. Please do check that out. Um, so this is just the final information about our website. Please uh, do uh, click through to that, um, use the information there, do give us feedback on what uh, is um, working for you and, and so on. So I'm just looking at the, uh, the list of um, comments that are coming up on the chat to see where we might start. Um, and I'm gonna ask James or um, uh, Steve, if they've seen anything in particular that I might want to start with. Well, Paul, I know that you were very keen uh, on the current situation with supermarkets, and we did some research about a week ago, didn't we? I wonder what the latest is on that, or, or in fact, if there is a latest. Yes, no, thanks, Steve. There, there's been quite a lot of concern about the difference in the way in which supermarkets have um, gone about making access to uh, NHS and care workers available. Uh, some stores really didn't have a policy at all for the first two weeks of the, uh, the lockdown. Uh, others have had uh, policies that seem to be being inconsistently applied. Um, and uh, together with the uh, Care Providers Alliance, Sky uh, have written a open letter to the supermarkets, all of them really asking them to A, have consistent policy and B, to actually have parity, parity of esteem uh, for social care workers. Um, one of the obstacles was that whilst many of the stores, Sainsbury's for example, were saying that they would take uh, uh, care workers in and let them in during the, uh, the time that's being allocated for people to have a, a golden hour of shopping, if you like, um, but they were saying they needed NHS identification, which of course uh, is absolutely no good for a care worker who is working for uh, a care home or a care agency as they're not uh, part of the NHS. So I hope that's beginning we're beginning to see some signs that's beginning to change, but I think uh, we can all play our part in just calling out uh, the supermarkets that are still not doing it and maybe shouting out and thanking those supermarkets that are now making that possible. Um, okay. So, I've got... questions are flying in now. So, um, we've had one about learning, yeah. learning disability services, day services, and also the unintended consequences of the isolation that we're all. Um, Yes, and, and the, the unintended consequences of the isolation, I think, is a real, a real issue. Um, and clearly part of that is about thinking about whether it's uh, the case for someone who is in this, this shield group, this one and a half million people who've been asked to uh, socially distance and self-isolate for maybe as much as 12 weeks in order to keep them safe and of, away from the, the, uh, the potential of becoming infected. Um, that, that keeps them physically safe, but I think there are real concerns about how we make sure that with the right support uh, from uh, social care, from volunteers uh, and from family being in touch through the phone, through other, other means, that we are keeping people uh, psychologically safe as well. Um, one of the things we uh, said in our response to a number of concerns that people had about particularly the, uh, the risks to people living with dementia was um, the importance of both planning, but also the importance of looking for various ways to communicate. So for example, uh, making a phone call or um, using some of these online postcard services where you can generate a postcard and send a, a letter or a postcard to someone just to keep uh, at least some contact going. And I think there's some information on, on, the, on the website about that. Um, I think at this point, I, I, it might be good for us to hear uh, from some of the experience of frontline colleagues. And um, I think we have on the line um, Kim Carey, who's the Director of Adult uh, Services at the London Borough of Bromley. Uh, I think she's got some of her colleagues. And it'd be quite interesting, I think, to, to maybe hear some of your views and experience of how services are responding, what support um, Bromley is providing, and, uh, and, and really to get your, your take. So I'm going to hand over to you, Kim, if you're there. Thanks, Paul. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I think 
Great, that's great. Uh, thank you so much for inviting us to join you this afternoon. Um, I'm sure in Bromley we're doing what many, many authorities are doing across the country. And what an opportunity, a very sad opportunity, but what an opportunity to raise the profile of adult social care that I think we've all been trying to do for a very long time. So I just wanted to reflect on some of the things as a director and as a council that we've been struggling with um, and having to deal with over the last couple of weeks and will continue to deal with as we go forward. So for me, there's a big bit about actually in adult social care, we still have the business as usual to deliver. And I can see a number of questions coming through that are about how do we continue to do that. So a big recognition that staff and managers are dealing not only with business as usual, but also responding to the pandemic. And in many ways, we're having to call on that same group of staff to do both bits. So to keep the business running and respond to the crisis. I think there's been an interesting um, issue raised for me about definitions of vulnerable. Uh, and I think within social care, we're probably well used to using our own decision making about vulnerability. And I've certainly been seeing some real differences between what um, professionals, what people working within councils, and also in terms of individuals themselves, in terms of their self-definition of vulnerable. And I think that creates quite a, a, a challenge for us in terms of delivering a sustainable response to our communities as we go forward. We've had huge positive public response, and I think that's been happening across the country. Um, really important that we capture those um, offers of support, that we respond to those offers of support, and that we harness that energy. Um, the public have really, really risen to the challenge of volunteering, but we do know that actually we need to engage with those people fairly quickly to keep them on board with what we're doing so people don't get fed up and think that they volunteered for nothing. And I think one of our challenges is about how, as councils, we work together with the NHS to manage that huge army of volunteers um, to make the best use of people. We know that there is a huge amount of um, data flying around. Um, I think that's quite a challenge about how we use that data, both in terms of managing the day-to-day, -day, but also how we plan uh, for going forward. And I know one of the frustrations that I've had is there's so much data, I don't know where to start with it. Uh, so I think some of our colleagues that don't traditionally get involved in delivering social care, we're bringing in to help us to understand what the data is telling us, what we can expect, but not just using some of the what's really helpful modelling, but using live data so we can respond in a timely way um, to needs uh, within our local areas um, and also with our, our um, colleagues in neighbouring councils as well. An issue, again, I think is challenging for us um, is who gives the advice? So there's a huge amount of, the, of advice coming. Paul, you've just shared some really, really useful advice. Uh, but this is an issue that's affecting the whole population. Who is it? that people are listening to. Um, we have local advice, we're having national advice, and then also a lot of advice or information coming out through the media. So I think for me, the challenge at a local level is how we manage that information in a, a clear way and give accurate advice to people in a situation that is changing very, very quickly. So some bits about how we all keep ourselves well, because this isn't just an instant that we're be dealing with over a couple of weeks. Um, we clearly need to remain calm and resilient. Everybody that's working in the care and health field um, is really under the spotlight at the moment. Um, but we also have to remember that we're not only doing that at work, but we're doing that at home. And I'm aware of a number of individuals for whom this is having a personal impact as well. Um, and people are having to manage risk and really difficult decisions within their working lives, as well as dealing with practical issues like getting shopping um, in their personal lives as well. And I think, Paul, you, you picked up on a, a really useful point about how we work with supermarkets to make sure that they're supporting not just the obvious people in uniform, but also those support staff, people working in care homes, um, social workers, to make sure that they can continue living their lives as well. 
So I'm hugely proud of the effort um, across the council and across all of our councils. Um, and what a brilliant recognition we had for the second time last night with the public doing their clap-a-thon. Um, I'm working from home remotely in Cornwall, which is an interesting experience. Um, I could hear, even from here, claps, fireworks, car horns, and even down on the coast, boat horns um, going. So a tremendous, tre tremendous um, outpouring of recognition and support by everybody working in care. Uh, and I guess my big wish from this is let's hope that people remember this when we all get back to normal. Um, so that's some headline bits for me. Um, it's, it's I've got Tricia with like yeah, can, before we come to Tricia, it'd be great to come to Tricia in a moment. Just two things I wanted to pick up. One is a question that's come through from several of our contributors on the chat, uh, and that's about um, the, the, the discharge arrangements and particularly uh, issues around um, expectation around testing of people being discharged and confirmation of whether they are uh, free of COVID-19 or not. I just wondered how that's being sort of handled in, in, in Bromley and what, what we might sort of learn from uh, from the way you're dealing with that as an issue. Okay, so what we've, we've done is to simplify our um, discharge arrangements. Um, so we're working very closely with our community health providers. We've got a single point of access um, for everybody coming out of hospital, and we have stripped right back our assessment process to make that as simple to manage as we possibly can. Um, in terms of testing of people coming out of hospital, that remains a big concern for us. Um, so I know that, that at a national level, we're starting to roll out testing for key staff, I know that a, con a huge concern for our providers, both locally and I'm sure it will be across the country, is people coming out of hospital, have they been tested? And at the moment, locally, we're not able to provide that assurance, which will, of course, be a concern um, to colleagues who are, are running care, uh, particularly where there are large numbers of vulnerable people living together. So we're continuing that discussion with colleagues in health and reinforcing that actually it's not care providers being awkward. They are making absolutely the right decisions to ensure that they're not taking somebody back where there's a risk of infecting large numbers of very frail and older people living in a collective setting. Thank you. And did you want to introduce your colleague, Tricia, I think? I will. I'll hand over to Tricia, who's my head of service for assessment and care management. So she's absolutely at the sharp end um, and managing the social work teams that are actually delivering this. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi, Tricia. Hello. <laughs> we can. Car carry on. Um, well, um, this is again is one of my, this is my first webinar, so um, I will do my best. Um, so I, I think for me, there's a few things that uh, that come up for us, and obviously PPE is a big issue. Um, but the issue with redeploying staff, we've already started to redeploy our staff, so that we're moving them around the service to ensure that the areas that are under most pressure can get the support that they need, and things like any work coming in through the front end of the service to make sure that everybody um, is able to be utilised to respond to people so that we haven't got people waiting unnecessarily. And some of those people that have been waiting unnecessarily have been a huge volume of calls we've had for people asking social care to deal with their um, food parcels. Uh, and that caused, in a very short space of time, within a couple of hours, 72 calls to our front end. Um, which And when those calls come in, they're not normally straightforward because you're checking more than just the presenting problem to make sure everything's okay with the individual. Um, so that's been a real issue. But having been able to redeploy some of our staff uh, to the front end there and to support the hospital discharges, at the moment we are managing. Um, I think the big thing around the different information coming out about PPE, when to use it, when not to use it, uh, that's been a real issue for our staff, and I've been sending out uh, directions to the staff. I've just sent out the second one, and it's got all the latest information on it. But as Kim says, things are changing so quickly that that's out of date very quickly, and we're having to reissue another direction to staff. Um, the, the main one of the issues you raised, um, 
earlier, Paul, was around the, and I've, I've read a bit of the information that's come around, around isolation. And um, as probably other councils in Bromley, we're using people like Street Friends and Snow Friends who are already on the council's list to uh, look out for their vulnerable neighbours. But, but obviously there's a lot more efforts going on there with the for the volunteers that have come forward. And our, and our organisations have already commissioned to provide voluntary services to, they're all working flat out as well to help with that. But it is an issue and it's an ongoing concern obviously for uh, for us in social care. Um, in and one of the things I've I, I picked up from, from conversations with, uh, with with a number of uh, directors of social services is obviously the, the, the public response in terms of volunteering uh, last week and the numbers of people that have come forward to, to offer in some cases, in some areas has been outstripping the ability to sort of make use of those volunteers. Um, and indeed, the number of tasks that are being sort of identified from the NHS, from care, and so on. Are, are you sort of a, in a position where you're you're able to fully fully occupy all the people that are wanting to volunteer in some way to uh, to help during the uh, the emergency? I think that we're um, we're not quite there yet. Oh, what we have... Sorry, Kim. I think Kim, did you want to come back in there? Yeah, I, I was going to rescue Tricia from this one because we've actually used <laughs> the support of okay. one of uh, Tricia's corporate colleagues to uh, respond respond to our, our huge um, number of volunteers that have, have come in um, and also to manage our shielding list. So we have had over 3,600 volunteers uh, contact us in Bromley and I guess that's what the point I was making about needing to keep in touch with those people so that they don't think that we're ignoring them. Um, for me it's about how we build some sustainability into our response. We don't want to use everybody and in fact we can't use everybody at the moment because we're responding to demand as it comes through but we clearly need to keep those people engaged so that when we do need them because others have exhausted their own reserves, uh, we can bring new people in to help. Uh, but it is it is a major issue when you've got that huge response uh, coming in. And we're not, we weren't geared up to respond to those, so it's one of the, the structural arrangements we've had to put in very, very quickly. Thank you. I'm going to take one or two of the questions we've got uh, on the chat, and if I can come back to you in a minute, and I, I may want to ask a question about the uh, the CARE Act and the uh, guidance around implementing the emergency legislation around the, uh, the, uh, the, the easements on the legislation in a minute, if I may. Um, I just want to acknowledge a few questions. We've had a question from Amy uh, asking about um, uh, access to, to, to drugs, both I think in, sorry, Amy was asking about, um, yes, drugs and, and, and lack of information. I think what we'll have to do on that, uh, Amy, is make sure that we provide you with a proper response, which we put on the, the website. Um, there's also a question about retrospective charging, which I think is possibly again part of the, the discharge arrangements. And I, I'll, I'll sort of give Kim notice of that because it would be quite interesting to hear her, her view on how that's um, actually working through. Um, and again, I think there was a, a question from, from Amy about the advice and guidance that's been made available around daycare uh, facilities. And obviously uh, they, they, they would have been closing during this period. But I think there's an issue about the information that is available to those who've been using those services uh, and, and clearly some guidance required by those that operate uh, those facilities. I think there hasn't been any guidance published on that yet. And it's certainly something which Sky can take up with the Department of Health and Social Care and make sure there is some consistent uh, messaging there to support social services departments and uh, make sure that we're giving the public a, a clear uh, set of information. Um, and, and then maybe if I, I will come back to Kim now, because one of the other questions I had was from Heidi, and that was very much about the, the guidance uh, that's been issued around the CARE Act changes, the shift of many of the duties that are in the CARE Act, making them uh, powers that can be exercised or not, as the case may be. Um, I think one thing I would observe is that the, the CARE Act's organising principle of promoting individual well-being hasn't been uh, if you like, downgraded. It's still there. It's still the, the way in which decision makers have to think about the way in which they're taking their decisions. But I'd be really interested, uh, Kim or, or, or uh, Tricia or, or Nick, I mean, I'll ask you, Kim, to sort of 
field how you wish, but to how you have taken that guidance now you're uh, translating into into practice and what support social workers and others are getting to make sure they're consistently applying uh, the arrangements. Okay, so, so Paul, I think you're right. The Care Act, um, I think, has always broadened the scope of our responsibilities, and certainly looking at people's well-being needs is is our primary focus at the moment. Um, I was reflecting last night over dinner um, with my husband that actually the opportunity or the um, uh, the, yeah, it is an opportunity to use the easements is probably one of the biggest decisions as a, a director of adult social services I've ever been given. Um, so I think this, it's, it's useful to have that opportunity. Um, I think the Care Act gives us the flexibility to engage with others to continue to meet people's well-being needs. And I really hope we don't get to the point where I have to introduce easements, um, because I think we have the scope as councils to continue delivering um, what we need to to individuals. And of course, our primary concern will always be to keep people safe and to keep people well and to keep them communicating um, with others as far as we are able. Um, so I'm hoping it doesn't get to the point that I or any others have to um, resort to that because it would be a, a, a big decision. Thank you. Um... And, and one of the things that um, I know is a very big concern across social care amongst provider organisations, it also goes into the sort of technology enabled care area as well, where uh, first responders are going into people's homes in response to social alarms, is, is access to the right, um, uh, right protective uh, equipment and so on. Um, as I think you've said already, Kim, that the guidance has changed several times over the course of the last two weeks. I think partly in response to uh, healthcare practitioners expressing concerns about whether what was being proposed was adequate. Um, but I guess there's still a more fundamental question if you're in a care home or delivering care in people's own homes, whether you're sending people in uh, not adequately protected. What, what's the position in terms of supply of PPE in your part of the world? Uh, so it, it it's been quite challenging. Um, I think we've got very good systems in place now to access as much equipment um, as possible. Supply has been a problem, but I think that's easing as we've uh, limited the, the streams of requests for for PPE, um, so I think it will get easier. Um, but as you've identified, um, the guidance has changed. Um, I slightly shocked the leader of the council um, yesterday when I sent him a note. He was asking me whether we had enough um, masks available, uh, not only for our own staff, but for staff within uh, care uh, settings as well. Uh, and I reported that I'd signed off an invoice that I had to double check with staff for £100,000. Now, what that bought us was 100,000 masks. We know that won't last very long. Um, I had then an interesting discussion with him about uh, m many years ago um, how that was uh, slightly more than the cost of the transfer of a fairly major uh, football player. Um, I can't remember the name of him. But actually, that is a staggering amount of money that we're all having to spend that we will be setting against the COVID budgets. Um, but we have we have to be getting equipment for where we where we can find it really, but we know that as an ongoing pressure um, and we need to make sure that we get that out to those people that are providing care directly to individuals because that's where the biggest risk is. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think I, I, what I do understand is there, 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 A, there's further guidance either just, just been issued or is imminent. Um, and I, again, I'm hearing from, from various conversations uh, with, with directors and others that um, there clearly have been issues around supply, but some of those are now being resolved. The suppliers are being sorted. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, if not already, and I'd be interested uh, with, with colleagues that are on this chat, if you have any examples of where you're still experiencing difficulties, do, do share them on this chat, because it would be useful for us to be able to feed that back uh, to colleagues uh, at the Department of Health and NHS England uh, to try and make sure that we uh, you know, are uh, up to date and begin to improve the situation. Um, 
I don't know whether uh, Trish, uh, Kim uh, Nick has been able to join us or not. Um, is he is he with us? Do you know? It doesn't look as if he is. I think he was having problems with his microphone. Oh dear. Okay. Um, that that's that's fine then. I think um, one other thing I would say is I, I've seen um, seen I think uh, Sonia was asking about the best interest uh, uh, tests that uh, apply in terms of mental capacity legislation. And I think one of these I pointed out earlier on was um, that we had produced some uh, some new guidance on on the MCA, uh, which was published just a, a few days ago. And I think that is the best place I think I would refer you to for getting more information about what the current uh, position is on on uh, what what you're required to do uh, un under the legislation. Um, I, I wonder if there's any other sort of particular issues that are. Uh, really to the fore with you in Bromley and you're picking up from your colleagues, uh, Kim? Um, so I, I think I'm picking up one of the earlier questions around daycare facilities. Um, in Bromley, um, all of our day centres have chosen to close. Um, we understand why that is, but obviously we're needing to redirect support to um, family carers um, and others who will be caring for people who will be out of their ordinary routine um, and will need support. So that has pushed a pressure back to some of our domiciliary care agencies and particularly to carers. Um, so our staff are having to find more creative ways of supporting people. Um, again, this isn't just a few days. This is, is for the long term. And we know that for particularly um, people with dementia, um, people with learning disabilities, being out of a, a routine, not being able to see friends, not do activities that they're normally used to, that will be a major challenge. Um, so we, we are considering how we respond to that in the longer term and using things like um, Skype um, and other means of communicating is, is really coming to the fore um, but in those situations. Thank you. And I'm seeing on the uh, the chat some feedback from uh, colleagues, um, uh, Danina and uh, Susan have both sort of fed back that the uh, it, the PPE is coming slowly, um, but uh, then sometimes it's coming in bulk. Um, but uh, it's obviously being used. The run rate for using PPE is remarkably quick, unsurprisingly. Um, so there are still issues about the adequacy of supply. Um, I would also just observe. Thank you very much for those that are providing answers. To other other colleagues' questions on this chat, it's really useful to see that, and that will all be available uh, after the chat, so people can uh, check out some of the information that's being provided there. Um, and I, the other one of the things that I, I was going to sort of also flag is that, of course, safeguarding continues to be uh, a, a real concern and a real priority. And the uh, easements in the Care Act do not apply, as I understand it, to to adult safeguarding. But I just wonder at the moment. Uh, Again, just getting uh, the opportunity of having a, a director of social services with us. Uh, what sort of ways in which uh, we can all play a part in improving uh, in these difficult times uh, our response to keeping people safe? Yeah, so you're absolutely right, Paul. That's one of our our key priorities, um, and it's. I think reassuring that everybody is expecting that we will still continue to keep people safe and that the safeguarding principles will apply. Um, it's one of the areas that uh, not just councils, but certainly within Bromley, our voluntary sector are recognising is that with large numbers of volunteers coming forward, there is always a risk that people will come forward for the wrong reasons. Um, so I have been really pleased with voluntary sector partners who have been very clear about the need to do some very simple checks for individuals to make sure that they are legitimate. Um, certainly in terms of our registration of volunteers, we did as much as we possibly could to ensure that the people were volunteering were who they said they were. And our safeguarding um, teams are the teams that are continuing to work. So 
where possible, we are doing that work remotely. We're relying on um, families. We're talking with care providers. But that is the one area where we are insisting, both in adults and within children's services, that actually visits will still need to occur. And where that's happening, we're making sure that staff have the appropriate uh, protective equipment so that they're not putting themselves at risk. But obviously, our primary concern is to make sure that people are safeguarded. Thank you very much. And again, I, I just comment that um, as, as the, uh, the chat continues, there's been quite a lot of feedback about um, the national supply disruption service um, and, and kit that people are getting. Um, maybe it's coming just in time, but not necessarily um, in, in the quantities that people are looking for. So we will certainly parcel up all of those comments uh, and, and feed those back to uh, colleagues at the Department of Health and Social Care. Um, and just uh, looking down the list of questions uh, to see if there's anything else I want to take. So I'll, there's a question here from Christine Towers. Are local authorities talking to family carers about their ability to cope if they become ill or the person they care for has become ill? Um, this, is, this is something that came up in some of the questions that we received last week. And uh, I'm going to come to Kim maybe to sort of pick up what sort of advice um, and support is being provided to family carers who... Uh, obviously are concerned about that, but I would just observe some really good resources are available on the Carer, Carer UK uh, website and on the Carers Trust website. Um, and I think the key thing is having some really good plans uh, and contact numbers and uh, ability to sort of escalate. But uh, Kim, would you be able to say a little bit about what um, what you're doing to sort of uh, support that, um, that that family carer? Uh, who might be worried about um, becoming becoming unwell and what would happen next? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you're right, Paul. All of those those um, things that you said, we're applying. Um, Romley were caught out this morning um, by uh, a young person with a learning disability that that we weren't actually in touch with. Uh, where both parents were very sadly admitted to hospital as an emergency, and we had to pick up that young adult very quickly um, without any of that planning. So I think we're doing an awful lot of work to work with carers that we know. Um, but this caught us unawares because we hadn't been working with this person before. So from that, our learning is we need to get better messaging out to the population um, to think about what their plans are in terms of who their links are if something goes wrong, if they're not in direct contact with us. because. In many places, um, councils won't be supporting everybody or every family that may, in this sort of crisis, have a problem if um, carers uh, become unwell themselves. Thank you um, very much for that. And I've just just seen a, um, Sue, Susan has come back with a, a sort of challenge, really, about one of the consequences of uh, uh, day centres being closed, particularly, I guess, day centres for um, people with learning disabilities. Um, and I guess the anxiety of when the routine changes, uh, that can lead to uh, issues around increased challenging behaviours and so on. I know there are some resources that uh, are out there through, through other charity organisations and uh, various uh, programmes or activities and advice. And we'll certainly make sure that uh, that's up on our website. And I've tweeted about some of that during the course of this week. But again, um, coming back to either Kim or to uh, uh, Tricia, I just wondered if Again, you've got any, any thoughts or reflections or advice for, for, for Susan on that? Yeah, so one of the things that we're doing is, is using some of our more um, experienced volunteers uh, to use their time differently. Uh, so, for instance, all of our leisure centres are closed at the moment, but we've got um, skilled and trained and um, checked staff um, who we're using very differently. They're used to dealing with groups of people. They're used to dealing with people with, with disabilities. We're using them um, to help to provide some respite for carers where that's appropriate. And we obviously can't do that collectively. And we need to do that uh, in a way that keeps people safe and doesn't cut across all of the rules that we're currently abiding by. But it does mean that we've got a whole army of people um, who are available and want to be useful uh, rather than sitting at home doing nothing. So we're being very flexible about using the skills of people um, to do things differently. 
Thank you. That's I think that's really again very helpful. And again, I'm seeing up on the chat quite a few people linking to uh, materials, for example, from the Challenging Behaviour uh, Foundation and uh, others, which I think would be is very useful for people to check out uh, after this webinar. Um, clearly, safeguarding is a is emerging as one of the other concerns that quite a few uh, colleagues have from a, a practice perspective. And obviously, when families are uh, perhaps confined in the way they are at the moment, there, there is inevitably uh, a heightened risk of domestic abuse, sexual abuse, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, Kim, you, I think, already said quite reassuringly the way in which uh, Bromley is pursuing its uh, responsibilities around uh, continuing to uh, follow up uh, concerns and so on. Is, is that, to your knowledge, also the case in children's services as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, so even more important in children's services, um, where we know um, schools are closed. Um, we've got the Easter holidays coming up. Families will already be stressed, but we're working very closely with our children's colleagues to maximise the use of staff across children's and adults. Um, and safeguarding in children's services is, is one of the, the primary services that they are um, making sure can keep running. Thank you very much. And I've just uh, seen a, a question, I think, from Heidi about um, uh, about the money, um, about paying. Um, if volunteers go shopping, um, how how they if they're not given the cash, how how that's all covered? I, I think what we might do is try to pull together some some advice on that, rather than giving an off the cuff response, um, so that we can give some some clear sort of steers on on what might be the right response on that. Um, I'd also just point again to the, the website, which is back up on uh, your screens uh, and our hub, and we keep posting new information there. Um, and again, if any of you that are uh, contributing to the chat on this particular webinar have any stories to tell about your own experience of working uh, during the emergency, things that you think would be helpful to share with others, then please do get in touch with Sky. I think we'd be very pleased, as we've already done with a, a number of colleagues across uh, the country who shared their, their lived experience and their practice and professional experience. And we'd like to do more of that to help people uh, over the coming uh, days and weeks. Um, and um, just looking at the, uh, the questions again, um, just also wanted to sort of come back to uh, maybe a question which is, seems a little premature possibly, Kim, but I, I'll ask it anyway. And that is, um, at some point, we will start to move out of uh, the, the peak of uh, the outbreak and begin to start to think about returning to um, the, the sort of business as usual, reopening, uh, sort of unlocking the lockdown, if you like. And uh, I know from talking again with, with colleagues in social care that some are maybe taking the view that the Care Act easements, um, it's better not to make the easements because you would then have to unpick those uh, as the uh, legislation came back on in full. But I just wondered what sort of thinking um, you would say both yourself and voluntary organisations and providers need to be doing now about what uh, the return to normal might need to include? Yeah, so I think what the local discussions we've been having um, are about actually building on some of the opportunities that we've got now in a strange sort of way. Um, within Bromley, we've got a, a very uh, large transformation agenda going on. Um, a lot of which is about how we work jointly with health, um, how we work with the voluntary sector. This isn't getting in the way of that. If anything, it's speeding up the process. So the discussions we've been having are about how we hold on to the learning from this crisis, um, how we, we hold on to the simplification of some of our processes and cutting through some of the bureaucracy that as organisations we built around to make sure that actually we can have a system that works better for people. Um, so we haven't had any more detailed conversations than that, but I think we will all be looking at actually what has worked well in a crisis. Are there things we can learn from this that we can take forward to mean that we really focus on people and their needs rather than some of our, our structures and some of our governance that sometimes stops us from doing things that make absolute sense. No, thank you. And I think one of the things I, I sort of am keeping in mind some of the work that I do uh, involved in uh, an integrated care system in Hertfordshire and West Essex, and, and more broadly than this, is everyone is working so hard at the moment to, to keep people safe, to 
keep themselves safe. Um, that does take its toll physically. It takes its toll psychologically. And um, they often say that the climb up a mountain is safer than the climb down. Uh, and I think that's one of the things we all, as uh, people in charge of organisations, need to be thinking about our people and how we, we keep them safe and enable them to keep the people they are keeping safe safe as well. Um, I've seen a, uh, again, lots of uh, useful uh, exchange of information going on on the chat. So please do keep referring to that. Um, I think there does seem to be an issue about um, uh, cash payments and volunteers going shopping, which uh, we will certainly check out to see what guidance has been issued either by government or by uh, people in the voluntary sector and see whether there's something we can uh, link colleagues to. Um, I think there's also been a question about um, whether or not um, they a, a family member can be paid uh, to care during the care crisis, uh, during, during, the, uh, during the, the, the current crisis. Uh, I think this is in terms of uh, direct payments and, 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 and uh, effectively appointing someone to act as your PA, uh, particularly in a situation where the, uh, the PAs themselves are uh, maybe self-isolating or unwell. Um, our understanding, although we will confirm this on the website uh, as soon as we get definitive answers on this, is that uh, you can do this, but it does require the local authority, local authority to take an individual decision as to whether it's necessary. Um, again, I'm going to come to you, Kim, to sort of get a sense of what uh, the approach in Bromley is to this, you know, whether a direct payment can be made to a family member to be able to step into that sort of caring role. Yes, absolutely. We've already made that decision um, that that's acceptable. It makes absolute sense. Can I also come back on the paying for goods? Because I think we may have found a partial solution um, to that. Uh, so one of the early things that we did um, working with one of our, our local voluntary sector partners was to give them a float um, so that they could go out and buy shopping and then reclaim that money from individuals once the shopping was delivered. We got out a, a a message very early on to say to people, don't just give someone that knocks on your door and offers to do your shopping cash. So again, thinking with our safeguarding hats on. Um, so that, that helped initially, but of course, pick cash that people have is drying up now. Um, so we have been in discussion with local supermarkets and some of them, and again, this may be something that we would, would want to advocate rolling out at a national level, uh, some supermarkets are happy to have a key link within their store so that when an individual has purchased shopping on behalf of somebody else, they can ring the person the shopping is for and take their payment details over the phone. Now, that won't work for everybody, but I would guess a lot of people will now have cards that they can pay um, either with a, a PIN that will have numbers um, on them that, to allow the payment to be made over the phone. There are challenges with it because we know um, with, with some of our prepayment cards that we've issued for uh, direct payment users that sometimes it's difficult for older people to see the numbers on their cards, but that might be part of a solution for people uh, who haven't got cash available. Thank you very much. I see we're coming towards uh, 10 to 3, and I think we're going to finish uh, this webinar at uh, about 10 to 3 itself. I've seen one um, further question, which is about... Um, uh, supporting people um, living living in uh, uh, in, in self isolation who may be having mild dementia, um, and I think what what um, we picked up from the research we've done and the advice that I think we are giving is very much one of in terms of the sort of network of family support um, using trying to encourage uh, the use of technology um, to have a Skype call if that's possible, setting that up so it can be done very easily. Um, or um, using uh, devices like Alexa to try and make the communication that way, or using the telephone uh, to have those conversations, or um, being able to maybe write and drop a letter in, things like that. All, anything that helps to create um, some sense of contact uh, and social connection is really very important. There's a number of uh, some information on our website about the use of technology uh, on the Sky website, and I would recommend uh, people have a look at that. I think I'm going to try and start drawing this to a close. I think we've had a lot of really uh, important questions about uh, areas where people feel that there would be benefit from more guidance and clarity, uh, concerns about the availability of supply of PPE, but some signs in some of the comments I've seen on the screen 
that that is beginning to improve but could still be better yet. Um, a desire, I think, also for um, clarity about how volunteers, uh, and we have so many people who come forward and want to contribute, can be, can be used both in the care system um, and also in our healthcare system and more generally. And I think, uh, we, again, we'll look to see what we can provide by way of answers to those questions later on. But can I, uh, on, on your behalf, thank um, Kim and Tricia for joining uh, this uh, live webinar um, and contributing so fully to, to the discussion. I think they've uh, shared some really useful insights into what's going on uh, in practice terms there in Bromley. Uh, and I hope that uh, this has been useful to those of you that have tuned in to this webinar. Uh, and we look forward to your feedback because I think we're looking to repeat uh, and do more of these sorts of uh, uh, webinars in order to provide information. Um, and with that, at 10 to uh, 3, um, can I thank you all very much? Uh, wish you well, stay safe and stay well. Thank you very much.